if an evening like this draws people like you, that there's a clear market for a serious book on the topic. And a serious book that isn't from one position. I think that's one of the things that's been pretty clear. So let's take a few questions and see what we get. Tom. Could you share your thoughts um, about Albert Hoffman's statement about his wonder child being a material aid to meditation and maybe incorporate some of your research on the subperceptual doses? You want to take the meditation part? Or all? Um, I don't know exactly what he said so much about the uh, good, for good for meditation. Um, and we also have, I think there's a, that Stolaroff article. Um, he was, as a meditator, he, he really tried has an article on you know using psychedelics uh, as meditation aid and gets into some detail about that. You can find that article online. Um, the microdose thing is an interesting new topic that a lot of people might not know about, and Jim's maybe the expert. <laughs> I'm the expert talking about it. <laughs> microdose, uh, which also is called a subperceptual dose, is a dose of any psychedelic um, ayahuasca. Uh, even Ibogaine and LSD and so forth. But it's at the level where, when I say sub-perceptual, is nothing happens in the visual and sensory world that's exciting. As someone described it, the rocks don't glisten even a little. <laughs> and what people are reporting who have taken sub-perceptual doses is that it has a lot of value. And I happen to be um, willing to accept reports of people using microdoses either in the past or currently um, with whatever they're doing it for. And at the moment there's a, um, a national study going on where uh, 100 people are using a certain number of microdoses over a period of a month and writing a daily report in a paragraph or so. Uh, there's a study going on with microdoses and Parkinson's. Um, there's a study going on with um, microdoses and depression. And it's one of my crowdsourcings. And so if you would like to either let me know that you're experimenting, jfadiman at gmail, um, and several people after an evening like this write me and say, I'd like to be part of your study. <laughs> Uh, let me give you one. I'm 49. I'm happily married. I've got two kids. I've got a wonderful career, but my creativity is slipping and I'm a design engineer. Um, I'd like to be part of your study. Dear unknown person, are you saying that you would like me to advise you on how you might be using or are you asking me to send you an illegal drug? Through the mail? <laughs> I have not had a response. <laughs> so, um, it may surprise you to know that I'm not a drug dealer. <laughs> oh, I'm shocked. Yeah, well, a lot of people are. <laughs> and since I've written a book called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide, I am so clean, it is awful. But I am very, very interested in collecting these, these studies of the use of microdoses um, for a potential article, etc. And I will say that Albert Hoffman, who was the part of your question, um, I think we can now say fairly definitively, used microdoses um, considerably during the last, at least the last few decades of his life. Um, he had, a, he, when he was asked, because he was always asked, how should I use LSD, his answer was, and I, I, my accent is probably a little off, but I, <laughs> he spoke it to me. He said, I say to them, always take it in nature. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we would call eyes open. Um, I happen to have come out of a, a different training system which was called, always take it with an eye shade. <laughs> with headphones. <laughs> Which is a different kind of work. And probably the best is a combination where at certain points it's useful to go inside and other times of the day it's useful to go outside. So the, the answer is microdosing is something we're looking at. The one nice thing about it is has, it makes no waves in the culture. 
Um, I have a wonderful report that's actually in my book of a, a woman named Madeline who says the only way anyone could notice on the day that I'm microdosing is that my computer screen, I put the, the light, the illumination down slightly. <laughs> Can Since you quantify microdose? Say that again. Quantify microdose? Um, 10 micrograms is a microdose. Okay. About 25 grams as you start to notice. The, the rocks do say, you know, the flowers just <laughs> kind of, you know, so way. That's LSD. And the equivalent in other substances. And since I am not a drug dealer, I can't give you any more details. But several people have said, well, how can I measure out 10 micrograms? The answer is, if you can't figure out how to measure out 10 micrograms, please don't join the study. <laughs> so it's a self-correcting mechanism. <laughs> uh, and somebody wrote me from a foreign country and said, hey, I'm going to microdose on 2CE, I think it was. And I wrote back and said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> he said, well, it's not, it's not illegal, and I thought it'd be fun. And would you, you know, kind of suggest how I should do it, and would you like a report? So the answer is, sure. And then he said, when I'm done with that, I'm going to do another substance. So there are people out there who are just, just little research hounds. <laughs> and one of the things I'm going to be start to do, and I will do it probably at MAPS in April, is teach people how to be subjects and experimenters in the realm where everything is illegal, uh, without doing anything that gets the experimenter or the subject in trouble. So we're, we're again, interesting areas. Um, and I'm not sure that it connects necessarily to the meditation research. I think the study that you heard about, which may or may not actually happen, these studies take an awful long time to get all kinds of permissions. But what you're getting is the, the way the culture is moving towards the blend of what we're both about. Um, as a, as several people suggested that we might argue. And I thought, well, no, that's just the wrong paradigm. The question is, how can we support each other? And how can we support each other? And that really is, I think, the, the, what I loved about what you started with. Uh, it had nothing to do with working on yourself. I loved the way you were framing Buddhism as this is a way to be of use in the world, and that the bodhisattvic path is to be of more use in the world. Um, and I thought, we, we in the psychedelic world have a lot, a long way to go before that's the way we talk. <laughs> uh, also, just thinking about even, you know, microdose might be the, the most, uh, you know, interesting to look at in terms of, are we using even not for some big um, dramatic experience, but just to even enhance our performance, I think we could also look really carefully from a Buddhist perspective to see, um, are we, do we feel like something's lacking? This is a, another kind of angle on this, is on any of, use of any of these things, uh, they may be really positive, and of course, maybe if we really felt like that was the case, we wouldn't meditate either, because we have to have some intention to do anything uh, positive, but um, but particularly um, taking in any any substance. Do we feel like something's missing with our current performance that we need to improve? And that you could say it's based on maybe a slight sense of discontent with our present experience. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I just this came to mind. This is this is my teacher, um, Tenshin Roshi in his book about the precepts, um, he says, uh, in the broadest sense, anything we ingest, inhale, or inject into our system without reverence for all life becomes an intoxicant. It's kind of an interesting definition of intoxicant. Like, yeah, it's in the context of reverence for all life. And then uh, he goes on to say, um, the essential issue here is that we're dissatisfied with our current experience. So you could say a little bit dissatisfied is maybe connected with we don't have reverence for all life, including our life in the moment. Um, this precept uh, about intoxication is about dropping all self-concern and appreciating all beings just as they are. It's kind of a usual way to 
talk about um, that precept, but um, from the Bodhisattva perspective. Uh, and yet within that, is there room for like, this may be helpful for all beings to shift my perspective. Since I'm supposed to be on the psychedelic side, I have this just wonderful story about Kenneth Roshi and Santa Cruz. Kenneth Roshi um, was British and um, studied in Japan and wrote an incredible biography called Selling Water by the River and ended up setting up the, the monastery in Mount Shasta, the, the Zen monastery. Um, and Kenneth was invited to speak at Santa Cruz. And Bob Frager, who was a professor at Santa Cruz at the time, later went and, and founded the Institute for Transpersonal Psychology, uh, had invited her. And so she stood up, and there was about 150 students, and she said, my name is Kenneth Roshi, and she was dressed something like this, only she was much bosomier and heavier and had a similar amount of hair. <laughs> and so, and this was the 60s, so she looked up. And she said, my name is Ken Roshi, I'm, I'm a Zen Roshi. Any questions? Isn't she supposed to say a whole lot? And finally, yes. What's Zen? <laughs> question. So, that was the way she did the lecture. And then we went to have lunch. And Santa Cruz at that point had a, a, a kind of free-range cafeteria system where you didn't have lines, you just kind of went. And uh, Kenneth had a plate which was about two-thirds pickles. And I looked at it and she looked at me and she said, you want to ask me why I have so many pickles? And I thought, I wish I was dead, actually. I said, yeah. She said, I like pickles. <laughs> and then she said, just in case I was still able to function, if there weren't pickles, I wouldn't have any. <laughs> Later on, when Bob Fraser and I wrote a textbook which had a chapter on Buddhism, uh, we sent it to Kenneth. And she unpacked that story by describing the difference between desire, which is healthy and human, and craving, which is the cause of suffering. And she indicated that had there not been pickles, she would not have craved them. As there were pickles, she could desire them. Mm -hmm. And it's it's been one of those stories that you know that has uh, certainly informed my life, and it also certainly helped me understand Buddhism at a time when I really had a a, neat, a fairly shallow view of it, I now have a much more mature, shallow view of it. <laughs> Thank you, that's a great story, kind of summary of Buddhism. <laughs> or we, say, we say, the great way is not difficult for those who hold no preferences. We have preferences, that's be called being human, but I'm not holding them means, yeah, no pickles today, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yes? Uh, I just had a question for you, sir. Um, the course that you're teaching at Sophia University, yes. uh, and it also said on the site that you've got two national studies going, and I was wondering what are the two studies and something that is the way the course. Um, Sophia University, um, of which I was a co-founder, and I have devoted myself a number of times, so now I'm a part-time adjunct faculty. Um, which means they can't fire me. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I have taught courses on psychedelics, not this year, and I've taught courses on creativity and William James, and mainly I teach Sufism, uh, which is another system we haven't looked at, um, and it would be another kind of evening with another kind of teacher, uh, since the Sufis are a little more um, 
clearly on the against side. Buddhists, as you know, are kind of in and out. Um, and the two national studies, one is the one I'm telling you about, the large microdose study of just individuals who are in the normal healthy, and then these little sub-studies when people write me and say, I'd like to do, I'd like to do such and such. So the, um, the Parkinson study, um, we don't know. You know but, but it's very exciting that there's a possibility. The depression study, the first results are, are as predicted, highly favorable. But we're trying to look at uh, what we don't know is when the system is running better, which seems to be what microdosing is about. It's what someone has called an all chakra enhancer. Um, some of you, particularly students, know about Adderall or other versions of speed. It's, by the way, identical. We're in a funny country, which is speed is the great scourge of the United States of destroying the brains of people, and they should all, and speed, you know, methadrine people should all get killed. Um, and we give the identic a drug with the identical uh, effects to hundreds of thousands of children every morning. We're a funny country. So um, we're just looking at the question of an all chakra enhancer versus just a, a kind of stimulant. Um, and how does that affect certain physiological conditions? And so I'm really looking for people um, with particular conditions. Um, with larger doses, we have a wonderful growing group of people, for instance, who've overcome stutter, usually in one session. Um, we have a number of people with lifelong allergies, one session. But these are not microdoses, and so we're just looking. And I happen to kind of like microdoses because, as I say, it doesn't bother anybody. And nobody gets in trouble. So far, in one of the, the first large study, we had one person who dropped out. And the wonderful thing is, you just stop. And why did she stop? She said, well, I normally take LSD once a year. We're talking about ritual and regularity and methodical. And she said, before that, I, I clean the house, I pay my bills, I kind of do everything I can to clean up my life. And she said, I was doing that every three days with microdosing. <laughs> and it was just too much damn work. <laughs> um, and actually, I know someone else who, before I was interested in this formally, um, basically said, with microdosing, I was a little too much in touch with my feelings. <laughs> and I didn't want to be. And so they also stopped. So does that? Yeah. OK, so that's what we're up to. OK? Yes, please. One more. Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm really interested in the integration process you kind of touched on, um, and how community plays a role in that. How what does? Community. Yes. And so I was interested if you could talk about the role of satsang and Buddhism, and then how uh, community can be reused in um, the integration process of psychedelic experience. Okay, so the question is the role of community uh, in both of our perspectives. Mm -hmm. For yes. integration. Yes. And so in Buddhism, um, Sangha is the spiritual community and very important, um, one of the refuges in Buddhism. Uh, that's a, we rely on the spiritual community for, to um, help sustain our practice, encourage us. Um, yeah, very important. Um, so it's not just an individual practice in that way. We, we do it together. Especially Zen tradition is very much like these meditation retreats are very much a group thing. We're in silence, but um, very close quarters, sitting right together, very interactive, lots of rituals about we serve food to each other in particular ways in the silence. Um, uh, so very important because part of what we're realizing is this non-separation and intimacy. It's, you could say, the realization is um, that we're all completely intimate uh, beyond our imagination. So community very important in Buddhist practice. Um, and psychedelic work tends to be more individual maybe. And there's a certain way in which even if people are tripping together that maybe when they start to get really into it and they can't talk anymore, um, it tends to become more individual, and yet, uh, this, the other side is, I've had experiences that are like excruciatingly intimate um, with psychedelics, 
Grateful Dead concert. <laughs> I mean, oh, you're one being. <laughs> that's, that's communal. I think that is a communal ritual um, yeah. that was commonly used in the tradition. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, my daughter took me to a Dead concert, and within minutes, we were offered drugs. And it was this incredibly awkward thing of both of us kind of realizing that our roles were difficult <laughs> and that I couldn't really let go because then she'd be with this old freak. <laughs> she couldn't let go because then I would know what she was really like. <laughs> so the, the question of community, there are communities that help each other with integration and actually the one that is I think most well developed is the burner community. And the burner community, if you begin to follow the post-burn events and so forth, and the, the burn groups, is, um, remember there's this wonderful term from, the, from Burning Man, which is, this is called the default world. Which is, it isn't like, the, it isn't like better. So there is a community to help people readjust to the, to the, the, uh, to the default world. And that this, since the burn, since the uh, Burning Man is one of the, the the closest replacement we have to Grateful Dead concerts, only it lasts for a week. Um, there is that. Uh, there are also small groups. I'm thinking of, of a group of people who I know, where the roommates formed a community and helped one of the roommates um, kick a bad drug habit. <coughs> as community, even though they were just roommates who, were, who didn't necessarily start with community. So, um, and again, the, the Daimi and the Vegetal and the uh, Native American, we've got church communities. Uh, and we're getting now pretty much, see one of the nice things about ayahuasca is it's not a solitary experience. Again, I have, I, won't, I have met someone, but they didn't do it again. They said, I just took ayahuasca and went off by myself. <laughs> and I thought, you do not say, hey, you want to drop ayahuasca tonight? <laughs> I've got a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so, the plants seem to have figured out that you need a certain community for things to work. And so there are communities building of, of, from the plant communities that seem to be a, a very healthy development. Um, if you kind of look at the age of development, and, and if we're now, say, Buddhism in the first 50 years after Buddha's death, which is kind of where we are with psychedelics, um, we're doing all right. Um, they had a lot more time to kind of work out the, the, some of the problems. So if you take one more question and call Sure, I also just wanted to mention another thought, random thought that came up. This was, I think it was, uh, Dennis McKenna recently say, listening to him saying something like, um, you know, people take, it kind of relates to this taking in a drug from outside. And I think also we have to be, I think people in the room know that drugs is a, um, is a kind of ridiculous category, right? That people who don't know lump it all together. Drugs cause addiction to people like um, living on the streets and due to drug addiction, it's generally not psychedelics. Right? And, and it'd be interesting to know if ever it was, people were just going down that road too much somehow. So very different things. But uh, anyway, Dennis's point was something like um, that we're basically uh, always on drugs. <laughs> like our, our consciousness right now is a, is a chemical state. And it's a very strange one, actually. It's like incredibly like filtered down in order to like deal with the conventional world, their chemicals have like narrowed down our perception to um, this very limited dualistic setup so that we can feed ourselves and stuff. I mean, it works pretty well. We shouldn't complain. But um, but uh, and then and then taking in from outside another substance that alters the, the chemical makeup that maybe shows us more like actually how things are. Um, so it's almost almost like being less chemically influenced by taking in another chemical. So that was kind of interesting perspective. Yeah. So there's a question. Yes. Almost kind of 
relates to what you just said about taking your thing from the outside world because I just wish to, I mean, I heard a lot of parallels being drawn between the state of consciousness taking, after taking psychedelics and the state of consciousness that you arrive in in a, a sensory deprivation tank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they're a similar experience without having to take in something from the outside world. Mm -hmm. And could you maybe comment, sure. elaborate on? Sure. <clears throat> And of course, meditation. What are you taking in during meditation? Oxygen, Air. oxygen and nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> and trace elements. Um, yeah, there's a kind of standard um, thing people in the psychedelic world do, which is they're very, in many ways, they have altered states. There's um, sensory deprivation, there's trance dancing, there's um, <laughs> fasting, there's drumming. Uh, but we all do that just, that's all, we all know that that's not really what we're talking about. We're really thinking that psychedelics are better than all of those or we would be doing the other things. <laughs> but the answer is that your mind is capable of doing a lot of things with a lot of different inputs. And the one I kind of like is um, holotropic breathing, which is you're still just doing what meditation does, you're just shifting the breathing pattern. And if you shift the breathing pattern, you shift the oxygen CO2 balance in the brain. And if you shift it in enough of a direction, how many of you have done holotropic breath work? Of course, in this crowd. How many of you have hung upside down and during the <laughs> Grand Canyon while eating a piranha? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's another way of altering one state. And so, again, what we're saying is, we have a lot of different brain states. We, we, this is a kind of neural soup. And we have lots of ways that the culture says, uh, that doesn't count, caffeine, that doesn't count. Okay, what was caffeine developed for? What was it come into the cultures where it came in to help all night prayer? Because you got bored and tired. But if you stoke up on enough coffee or tea, you can just keep doing repetitive prayer. And, and of course, at certain times it became illegal. And as, there's a new book out called The Golden Holocaust. And it's about how we have bought into that it is okay to legalize, advertise, and glamorize the major poison that we take in on the planet, tobacco. And that somehow we've made it a free speech issue. Bizarre. You know, I listened to it and I thought, wow. I had thought it was a free speech issue. I've been tricked. And then it turns out the same companies that developed all the arguments to protect themselves against legislating against tobacco, the same money has now gone into climate denial. It's the same people. And one of the reasons climate denial has been so successful in the United States, by the way, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Everybody else knows we're nuts is because it's been skillfully done by people who practiced on tobacco. Mm -hmm. And so as, you know, as a, I, there's a chart the marijuana people show, and it's, you know, number of deaths, tobacco is up top, and alcohol. The one I love is one right below, right above marijuana. Anybody know what it is? Coffee. Peanuts. <laughs> hundred deaths a year. And then you go to marijuana, zero. <laughs> and I love that poster because then I can say, Let's ban peanuts. <laughs> Everybody then says, that's dumb. And I say, OK, you win. <laughs> so we're, it's hard to, again, get out of one's culture. One of the wonderful things about meditation is it's not about anything. There is something called contemplation, which is another system using the same, basically a lot of the same physiology and the same breathing pattern and so forth as meditation. But it's, it has a different, a different use. And it's much more within the Christian tradition. Um, well, I think we began this evening not knowing where we were going, and we got there. <laughs> and we got there partly because we were in harmony, but more so because of the absolute um, pleasant calm and clarity and attention paying that we that we all have had with each other. 
Um, you know, we've been with a lot of groups, and I've been with a lot of groups, and it is such a pleasure to be with a group of, most of you are as knowledgeable, certainly as I am, on the topics that I talk about. And yet, you're here in an open sense to see where this goes. And again, as we saw, all of you have also had some level of Buddhist training. And you were, again, here open to see where it goes. That's, that, that isn't to be overlooked. That isn't to be, oh, yeah, that's fun. It's actually wonderful. And I am just hopeful that out of this evening, and um, the people who have asked to see a, a, you know, the edited version of this, will get some sense of who you all are. And so I'm just uh, incredibly grateful that you are who you all are. And also, again, I'm incredibly grateful for, for Andrew for the poster, for Michael for the sound, for Renee and friends for the brownies, um, for the number of people who, um, these chairs didn't all appear like, you know, they weren't here when we arrived. Uh, and for Jerry Stolaroff, who is uh, Meyer Stolaroff's son, who um, brought an awful lot of all the, all the jackbacks and a lot of the, the chairs. Just a lot of people made this happen. So one of the questions that you're asking about community is, that's how community works, is people felt that this was worth supporting and that they turned out. And uh, as Yogi said to me, you have a lot of connections in Santa Cruz. <laughs> and the answer is, no, I used absolutely all of them <laughs> to make this happen because that community that I'm a part of supports what we're really doing. And what we're really doing is hopefully, I hope we're doing what you started by telling us that Buddhism is doing. I hope that, that psychedelics are moving a lot more to you rather than Buddhists moving towards us. <laughs> Yeah, may we may we all stay connected and um, uh, realize that our our intimacy and um, hopefully something good has come from this. We at the end of um, Dharma events we often dedicate the merit any positive energy that was generated by the discussion to the benefit of all beings to the awakening and freedom of all beings. And um, if we're ready to close, may I just um, uh, finish with a, a classic quote of, again, Dogen Zenji, the Japanese founder of Soto Zen. It's kind of sums up the practice. It's one of the classic um, things that Dogen says is, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. But to study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by myriad things. When actualized by myriad things, your body and mind, as well as the bodies and minds of others, drop away. No trace of realization remains. And this no trace continues endlessly. Thank y'all for your support and presence.